General, thank you very much. And uh, the process that we have uh, followed in, in these workshops is to uh, open the workshops uh, with remarks and follow it with a panel discussion. And I want to take this opportunity to uh, introduce uh, some of the panelists. And, uh, but before I do, I want to acknowledge and uh, second the comments of the Attorney General concerning uh, Christine Varney, uh, the Assistant Attorney General for the Antitrust Division. Uh, she has been uh, passionate about these issues. Uh, she has been at every workshop and fully engaged in every workshop and has been working with our uh, team uh, to better that communication that the Attorney General talked about. So, Christine, thank you uh, for being here. Uh, just to give you a, a little of her background, uh, she's held leadership positions in both the public and private sectors. Uh, from 1998 to 2009, uh, Christine Varney was a partner at Hogan & Hartson uh, LLP in Washington, D.C., where she served in a dual capacity as a member of the firm's antitrust practice group and head of the Internet practice group. From 1994 to 1997, she served as a Federal Trade Commissioner at the Federal Trade Commission and was a leading official on a wide variety of Internet and competition issues. Prior to her service in the Federal Trade Commission, she served as an assistant to the President and Secretary to the Cabinet during the Clinton administration. So, um, General, thank you for being here. And now, now the panelists, and we again want to thank each and every one of these individuals for taking time uh, to be involved. I'm going to do this uh, in, in uh, alphabetical order. Ben, we're going to start with you. Uh, ben Burkett is uh, a farmer. Uh, he's farmed land in Mississippi. Uh, his family has for 121 years. On uh, once was a cotton farm. He now grows 16 varieties of vegetables and organic herbs for farmers markets and local cooperatives. He's a director of the Mississippi Association of Cooperatives an arm of the Federation of Southern Cooperatives Land Assistance Fund. He's also president of the National Farm Family Coalition. Sitting next to Ben is Barry Carpenter. Uh, Barry Carpenter is the CEO of the National Meat uh, Association. Assuming this position in 2007, following a 37-year career here at the USDA. During his tenure at uh, NMA, Barry has actively represented the meat industry on an array of key issues ranging from food safety initiatives uh, to immigration reform. He has been heavily involved on export issues, especially working with the USDA and the USTR uh, to support negotiations, uh, including uh, our Korean free agree uh, Korea Free Trade Agreement, to open markets for U.S. beef and pork. So, very welcome. Uh, sitting next to Barry is er Eric Lieberman. Uh, Eric is a regulatory counsel for the Food Marketing Institute. Previously, he served as the majority regulatory counsel for the House Small Business Committee from 2004 to 2007. Eric was a director of government affairs at the National Grocers Association. Prior to that, he served as a legislative assistant to then U.S. Senator Bob Graham. Uh, sitting next to me on my left is Vaughn Mayer. Vaughn is a third generation beef producer from northwestern South Dakota, managing a purebred Angus and Red Angus cattle operation, diversified by a dry land farming operation with his wife and son. Uh, the ranch was homesteaded in 1909 by Vaughn's grandfather, uh, and purebred livestock was added in 1955 by his father. He commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Army Medical Corps. He's been involved in numerous state, local, and national organizations, including the South Dakota Stock Growers, RCAF USA, and U.S. Cattlemen's Association. Next to Vaughn is Dan Vincent. Dan is the chief executive officer for Pacific Coast Producers, a grocer-owned cooperative founded in 1971, which is made up of 165 family farmers in the San Joaquin and San, uh, Sacramento Valleys. He has served as vice president of the private brand sales for Del Monte Foods, as well as in the corporate agricultural credit for the Bank of America. He is affiliated with the National Council of Farmer Cooperatives, the Ag Council of California, and is a board member for Superior Farms. Uh, and sitting next to Dan is, is Chris uh, Walworth. Uh, Chris is the director of the Food Policy Institute at the Consumer Federation of America, an association of nearly 300 nonprofit consumer organizations that seeks to advance the consumer interest through research, advocacy, and education. Uh, Chris oversees the research, analysis, advocacy, and media outreach for all food policy uh, activities at the Institute. So we have a broad cross-section of folks. And uh, the way this is going to operate, uh, I'm going to open it up with a question, then I'm going to turn it to uh, General Holder, and then uh, we'll sort of go back and forth. Uh, to just to give the, 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 the audience uh, just a sense of this, we know that consumer demand, and this is a question I'm going to pose to all of the, uh, of the, the uh, panelists today, 
We know that consumer demand has changed over, uh, over the years. And in some cases, uh, consumers are spending a significant amount of their food dollar away from home uh, in restaurants. They're purchasing more prepared meals at supermarkets. And the retail value appears to be concentrated to the processing and retailing side. And that may very well be a reflection of these changes. Uh, my question is, tell us a little bit from your perspective how consumer demand impacts decisions on food marketing. And for those of you that work or represent retail, processing, or distribution, can you walk us through how you ensure that that demand is being met appropriately? So uh, let me start, Ben, if you don't mind. I'll start with you, and we'll just right, go right down the line if that's okay. Thank you. I'd like to say good morning to everyone, to the Secretary and Attorney General for allowing me the opportunity to be here to speak on behalf of family farmers. Uh, in my area, consumers are really want to know where their food comes from. Uh, the consumers are really driving the Know Your Farmer effort and, and to really realize that to buy fresh, to buy local is, is a support of the local community. So what we tend to do is stay in contact with groceries and supermarkets and through the farmer's market where well, we will know that we are producing what they really want and the need of the consumer that local is the way to go. From the packing industry perspective, uh, our customers are obviously retailers and food service companies. And our feedback on consumer demand comes through them as they place their orders and they come to us to develop new products. The message we hear loud and clear is that some things haven't changed. Consumers still want a consistent quality product and they're looking for a product that has value. Uh, in addition to that, there seems to be more and more of an awareness of making sure you get what you're looking for in your products. Uh, and that's being, that's being dealt with through branded products. In, in a recent meat case study funded by the beef checkoff and pork checkoff, over two-thirds of the, pro the meat packages in the meat, on the meat case were branded. And those brands carry a message and are there to the intent to develop trust with the consumer. So, Consumers are clearly looking for credibility in, in the products they're buying and that they are what they say they are. So from a packer perspective, our focus is to be able to fill those brands day in, day out with a consistent, high-quality product. Uh, I just want to say it's an honor to participate in the panel this morning before I begin. Um, retailers meet demand through forecasting based on historic models. Past performance is a key indicator. Some retailers track daily demand. Demand is met through this proper forecasting and working with suppliers. Factors considered in making uh, decisions at the retail level include the demographics of the market, seasonality, time of month. Folks tend to spend more money earlier in the month, you know, after they uh, get paid. Um, and of course, advertising drives demand. So you look at how consumers respond to advertisements in the past, maybe a feature on the front page of a flyer, and then you forecast accordingly. <clears throat> Can you hear me out there? Uh, as a producer and representing producers, uh, uh, we, we noticed that uh, there's been a 20% increase in the last uh, a decade here of, of, uh, of certified programs and branded, branded programs, and we, we realize that that's what the uh, consumer is looking for. But overall, I would have to say that the producer out there is really having trouble understanding what the consumer wants. Uh, because if you look at our, our cattle cycles in the last year, we typically have been going through cattle cycles of 10 to 12 years. And, and these, these cattle cycles, you know, as consumer demand decreased, why, why then you, you have your cattle numbers following and decreasing and so on. These, these cattle cycles are not there anymore. In, in 1980, we, we witnessed, uh, or the 1980s, excuse me, we witnessed eight years of, of uh, cattle uh, numbers of dispersions and, and the number of lowers. And, since 1996, we've been we've been on a liquidation phase uh, in the cattle industry. So I'm I'm really not sure that uh, producers know what they want to do out there or, or where they should be on there. Or part part of it, there's several reasons. And there are uh, the age of the producers is getting up there, and and uh, we have imports coming in and taking that over. But we do we do recognize that there there's a 20 percent increase in branded products. But at the same time, it's it's tough to uh, follow. Out there, we, if you if you study the cattle cycles and that in our liquidation phase. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I also want to thank you for letting us be a part of this and for our 165 family farms I represent. Um, yeah, I will say, echoing a couple of thoughts, um, the thing that's really changed, I think, in the last 10 years and, and what I'm seeing in, in terms of uh, marketing is, you know, how a consumer determines value, I think, has changed. It used to be just price. Now it's this combination of price, quality, and food safety recently. We've seen that a lot in the last two years. Um, so I think it's delivering that value for our business. It's a little different than the, the meat. We're center store commodity. We're canned fruits and vegetables. Um, we've seen that uh, value trend move towards private brands, which has actually helped our company quite a bit because that's what we do, private label. Um, and that's been a major uh, marketing trend for uh, Center Store. Um, I'd also echo what Eric said. That's pretty much the process we go through with our customers is we set down an annual plan. We're a seasonal packer, so you can only do it once a year. Um, we use historical forecasting and forward forecasting. Um, put that together and then work with them on a day-to-day, -day, week to week basis as we go through the year. Um, we have things, they're called bookings, they're really not contracts, they're basically just buying intentions and we have to stay competitive throughout the year. So. Chris? I, I'm in a little different position here because I represent consumers as opposed to uh, working to produce food for them. Um, so I, I wanted to highlight just a, a couple quick things. One, I wanted to pick up on something Ben said, is that consumers are becoming more and more interested in where their food's coming from. And um, it's, it's echoed in the uh, increase in the interest in local and sustainable food and organic food, but it's also um, consumers want more information, period, about their food. Um, where it comes from is one issue. They also want to know that the food is nutritious, that the food is safe. Uh, they want more information about what the ingredients are, what makes up the food. So it's, it's consumers really are looking for a lot more information about their food, certainly not less information these days. Sure. Well, I think um, different parts of the agricultural industry, agriculture industry face um, diverse challenges today, and I think these challenges are likely to change as we move into the, into the future. Um, with respect to competition, each seg segment of the agriculture industry may have uh, different perspectives on how we can ensure that there is a fair and competitive marketplace. So I guess the question that I have for everybody is what do you think the um, major differences will be um, in the industry from your perspective in 10 years? I mean, looking 10 years out, what do you think the, the major differences will be from where we are now? And then a uh, follow-on to that is what is needed um, from your perspective to ensure a competitive and open agricultural economy um, in the future? So differences in the next 10 years, and what do you think we need to do to ensure um, a competitive and open um, agricultural economy um, in that time period? Maybe we can start uh, with Ben again. Again, I think the, the concentration of the marketplace is really, really playing an impact on producers, where you have only maybe four major chains controlling the majority of the marketing of, of fresh produce and vegetables. I think in the future, in the next 10 years, that really need to change and open up and be more transparent where well, small farmers or cooperatives can be a major player in the marketing and receive a higher margin of the profit back to farmers. Sure. Under the current structure we have now where the concentration in the poultry industry and the dairy industry and, and especially in my industry of growing vegetables with only four or five major buyers. And I think that should be, I don't know how you can change it, but in the future it definitely need to be restructured where it can be opened up to uh, different avenues of marketing instead of the tradition that we've been going, the road we've been going down for the last 15 or 20 years. It need to be reorganized from top to bottom. Can I, can I ask a follow-up to that? Then do you, is consumer demand going to drive part of that? If consumers are, you I'm know, most, not all of us have. Most certainly, as was stated, consumers are very aware, want to know where their food come from, who produced it, the quality of it, the safety of it. And I think us as family farmers in the middle of those on, not necessarily the huge operation, but those truly family farmers operations is able to feel that void and, and farmers Consumer would know that tomato, uh, in my case, okra, I grew it. Okay. 
when we look at consumer demands and, and what differences we see in the future, clearly where the meat and the livestock industry are, are going to have to go is to focus on those, those needs. And when you look at where they're going, certainly I mentioned earlier the branded products is, is two-thirds of the marketplace. That's likely to, likely to continue to grow. And when I talk about branded products, we're bringing in everything from sustainability to locally produced, which was discussed earlier, some of the specialty programs for natural and organic. Those are all, are all going to continue and, and probably grow in the marketplace when we look at demand. So what that does to the industry is that, that really dictates the need for relationships from the consumer back to the producer. And in order to fill those orders for natural or organic or whatever it might be, you need to have a relationship from the production sector through the packer to the marketplace so that you can have a consistent, steady supply of those products. Uh, consumers are going to continue to demand that not only they, they have those options, but also that they can consistently get those. Now, as far as things that, that need to happen to get that done, you really are going to have to look to these long-term relationships to be able to create some value. If producers are creating value in livestock by going to the extra cost of grass feeding, for example, they need to know that they're going to have a mechanism for capturing that value that they added as it moves through the marketing chain. And so I think you're going to, to see success in this industry for all parties, and that's what has to happen for the industry to continue. You're going to have to see more and more uh, communications up and down the marketing chain and more cooperation to really target the needs of the consumer because that's ultimately what the whole industry is all about. Well, I think when you look into the uh, future in the retailing side, you're going to see continued diversification of the marketplace. And we're seeing that already right now. Um, it's really amazing how the market has changed. 30 years ago, folks had to buy most of their groceries at a conventional supermarket. But you look at the marketplace today, it's so much more diverse. There's so many more retail channels where you can purchase groceries. We've got, of course, the conventional supermarkets, but we have super centers now. We have warehouse club stores. We have convenience stores, chain drug stores, natural food stores, and dollar stores. So folks are going to more retail channels now. And this has resulted in very intense competition. So we're talking about margins that are a penny a dollar. And I think in the future, we're going to see continued comp diversification. It's going to mean even more competition, lower prices for consumers. You know, in the 1940s, the American family spent about 19% of their income on food eaten at home. Today, that's 5.5%. That's raised quality of life. This increased competition is helping American consumers, and I think it will uh, continue in the future. Okay. Uh, Vaughn? Well, I'll agree uh, with a lot of that that was just said. Uh, what we see sitting on the Angus board, uh, we, we see a, an increase in a lot of uh, demand for uh, niche products. Uh, the natural, there's, there's a group out there that want the all natural. Now, we don't see these percentages going any one way. You've always got your diversification. You've got this group that wants that and that. Uh, so I, I believe that in the next 10 years, or we will probably see a lot of that. As far as uh, communication at all levels coming back down from, from the consumer to the producer, uh, we definitely need that. But the main thing on communication from, from that uh, period from uh, standpoint uh, for producers is that we have to be there. Just the struggle to be there in 10 years for producers is going to be quite a quite a feat. Uh, you know, at the rate we're losing uh, 1,000 producers a, a month, that, that's alarming. And uh, so, you know, we, you know, we're ready to work, we're ready to listen, but we've got to be there first on the thing. Uh, we've got to have fairness in the markets, and we, we've got to have uh, uh, we, parity for our product if we're going to be there is, is the main, main problem we have. When you look at uh, the consumer price index this last year went from uh, up on all food products at 1.4%. Uh, and we out there as producers have a lot of fixed costs in that. Well, our, our fuel, all fuels went up 5.4 percent. Uh, gasoline went up 9.9 uh, percent. .9%. Diesel fuel, which is a big item on, on farm and ranches, went up 14 point percent. That's nine times over what we increased in food. So our struggle as far as producers for the next 10 years is just going to be uh, trying, to, trying to be there so that we can produce those foods for the consumer. 
Um, well, I, I think what we see coming the next 10 years, you know, well, actually, looking back the last 10 years, the trend we saw was consolidation, as we've discussed. Like, for our company, uh, 10 years ago, our top 10 accounts in retail were 50 percent of our revenue. Um, today, the top 10 accounts are 90 percent of our revenue. And in food service, it's even more concentrated. We have two accounts that make up 90 percent of our food service business. And we pretty much sell every account in America. Um, so, but I actually see that consolidation, at least the trends we're seeing now and the new customers we're talking to leveling off. And I think Eric's right. It's kind of uh, spreading out a little to new, new uh, players, um, limited assortment players, dollar stores, um, people like Trader Joe's, those kind of people. So it's, it's, I think that level of consolidation has pretty much peaked, and now it's going to start fracturing a bit, which I think is good for everybody. Um, and I do think looking into the future, I think a lot of these – uh, current issues that are important to consumers like food safety, sustainability is a huge deal. We, uh, we, we do sustainability all the way from farm all the way through the supply chain. Um, and ethical practices are becoming a, a big issue now, uh, audits. Um, I think those are going to continue. So, okay. Chris? I, I'll add a couple things in terms of uh, consumer demand in the next, next 10 years. I think there's going to be an increase in uh, consumers wanting to eat healthy, wanting to um, have healthy, nutritious diets. That's going to manifest through increased fruits and vegetable purchases, but then also um, increased demand for information about uh, uh, food and, and how nutritious it is. Nutritious it is. Um, convenience will, I think, continue to be a driver for consumers. We all live very busy lives. A lot of uh, our households have two incomes. And that means that we, when it's time to cook dinner, we want something quick and easy. And so that's going to, uh, I think, continue. Um, we're certainly not getting any less busy. <laughs> um, there's also, I think, uh, as consumers uh, become more educated over time and uh, incomes increase, there is uh, increased demand for variety of foods and, uh, and having a, a true variety uh, that's available. I, I did want to kind of caution us in making broad statements about, about consumers. I mean, while it, uh, may be true that uh, consumers generally have more access to uh, groceries in various retail outlets. That's not the case for all consumers. If you look at low-income consumers, for example, especially folks in inner cities, they do not have the same access to fruits and vegetables because of a lack of uh, retail establishments there. And I know USDA is trying to make efforts to, to change some of that, but, but there's been a, a long time period that we've had where um, consumers, low-income consumers in urban areas have not had access to, uh, to healthy fruits and vegetables and other healthy foods simply because they don't have access to uh, retail, retail outlets. Well, Chris, let me just add to that that it's not just urban centers. Uh, right, right, the, there are uh, obviously exactly. areas in rural communities where you may be 10 or 20 miles away from the nearest full-scale grocery store. Right. So it is, a, it, it is an issue, and it's one that we are trying to address at USDA. Um, I, I want to uh, sort of touch on something that Vaughn said just to give people a sense of this. Um, if we went back to 1980 and we asked ourselves how many pork producers there were in the country, the answer would be roughly 667,000 pork producers. Today there are 67,000. So 90 percent of our pork producers are out of business. If we asked the same question about cattle producers, what we would find is there are about 1.6 million in 1980. Today there are about 975,000. In the dairy area, uh, if we just go back 10 years and ask how many dairy producers were there, about 110,000. Today, they're about 65,000. So to, to reinforce uh, uh, Vaughn's concern about the fact that there is a, a, a re reduced number. And if you look at the people that produce the bulk of our food, 85 percent of our food, it's really about 200 to 300,000 farmers. And if you look at farmers generally, it's about 2.2 million farmers, less than 1 percent of our population. And Roughly one tenth of one percent produce eighty five percent of our food, hmm. and so and if you look at at who's making money in farming and who's just barely making it, what you're going to find is one point nine million of the two point two million farmers in this country are either losing money or in one of the best years we've had in a long while where farm income is up thirty one percent. Those farmers in the middle will make about an average of sixty four hundred dollars their farming operation. That's not enough to support a family. So it's, it, that, that, that's part of the challenge. The folks who are producing the most are going to probably do pretty well financially this year, uh, but the bulk of folks who farm may not. 
which which is why we need off farm income and rural uh, development. So that that raises the question. I want to I want to pose to Eric and and Barry uh, and and Dan. If you want to pipe in, please feel free to do do so. Uh, from your perspective, and I, I'm just curious in terms of the relationship. You talk about relationships. Um, are you seeing uh, the more specific requirements being demanded uh, from uh, grocery stores? And specifically, is there a difference between the large operations, uh, the, the Walmarts, uh, the Safeways, and maybe smaller independent operations in terms of what they are demanding? Uh, I'll, I'll go first on that. Uh, the demands are, are very specific in most cases. The, the relationships between the packer and the retailers of food service are generally tend to be long-term relationships. So what happens is the packer actually works with their customer to identify <clears throat> what their specific needs are and even to R&D actually develop products that target the, the kinds of products they want to sell so they can maximize the, the, the value of that product. So what we see happening is we, we see this, this communications and this relationship becoming stronger and stronger uh, between the, the packers, processors, and the food service retailers. Now, a critical part of that is you can't satisfy those needs without those relationships back to the suppliers because many of these attributes that are being demanded by the retailers and food service originate with the livestock. So in order to, for the packers to have a consistent supply of those products that are unique to those retailers, they have to have arrangements with those suppliers so that they know that day in, day out, they're going to be able to get a consistent supply of that product. As far as the size of the, of the customer, uh, there's not much variation there. They all have their, their niches and their needs and what kind of products they want to sell to the consumer. And they come to the packers and they, and they target those. And one of the things that becomes very complex in the packing industry is that uh, different packers have different customers, obviously, and they tend to be long-term customers. So the type of livestock that one packer needs to fill their orders may not match another. So what one packer is willing to pay a premium for may just be a commodity price to another packer because it may not fit their, their mold. So this, this connection from the product origin of the livestock to the ultimate consumer is, is very critical and the attributes that they're willing to pay for and insist on have to flow through that process. So, so I, I, think it's a, I think it has to be a very transparent process so that, so that the, the, the message can go very quickly from the consumer back to the, to the livestock producers so they can, through genetics and management, they can target the needs of the marketplace. Mr. Secretary, I think it, it varies. And when you look at our members, some of our smaller guys like the branded meat programs and they use it to uh, meet the demands of their consumers. Some of our, some of our bigger guys have branded programs, others don't. They, um, it's not a priority for them. But retailers, a number of retailers do have specifications for, for the meats they sell. They may relate to breed, consistency, food safety, animal welfare, sustainability, or something like tray size. Um, and retailers pay premiums for these products. And this has increased the quality of, of the uh, meat that you're seeing in the store. And also, combined with the vigorous competition on price, it's helped to stem the decades-long decline in meat consumption. Meat consumption declined um, from 1979 to 1998 by nearly 50 percent, and that's stopped. So I think these, these value-added branded programs have, to some extent, reinvigorated consumer interest uh, in the meat case. Our latest meat survey cites quality as the number one factor, prompting increased meat purchases at retail. And I think some of these premium meat products are um, bringing more quality uh, to the consumer, and that's generating demand. Dan, how about on the, on the vegetable food yeah, size? Well, I think your question is, are the demands changing or growing? And uh, yeah, definitely. Um, you know, it used to be, what's your price? And that was it. Um, those have definitely changed. Um, they're asking for us to add a lot of value to the equation for the retailer or the food service uh, distributor and ultimately the consumer. Um, probably the biggest one 
you know, in the past 10 years has been managing supply chain. Uh, before it was all picked up for our products West Coast. Now we are pretty much two days to market anywhere. We have 28 Ford warehouses we manage, and, and they expect us to manage those inventories and get them to market. Um, and that's why the relationships are important, because you're moving inventory all the time to keep in stock. Um, a lot of these initiatives, we've talked about sustainability, ethical practice. Those are really hot items. Um, food safety is the biggest demand uh, that's been asked for. Um, like at our plants, we had 45 separate audits last year. Uh, and these are customer audits, not FDA, state, or federal. Um, and the big initiative that I think we'll all see in the next um, couple of years, we're already there, uh, are going to global food safety initiative standards for food safety. And uh, we're under SQF, uh, Safe Quality Food Level 3. So I think you'll see everybody there pretty soon. So. Okay. Chris. Uh Question for you, uh, and you, cut, you touched on this, I guess, in your earlier remarks. Consumer demands have uh, have changed, and uh, some would say they've changed because families operate under um, increasingly tight budgets. Uh, both parents work, you know, long hours, and uh, families need food that's quick and easy to prepare. Um, I know that's the way my household works. Um, and you're preparing the food, <laughs> and you have only sometimes one uh, one person who's preparing the food. Um, <laughs> That would not be me in my family. <laughs> um, has your organization done any studies, or uh, can you offer any perspective on how these, these lifestyle changes have impacted consumers and changed consumer um, demands? And do the options that uh, we see on store shelves dictate um, consumer choice? Uh, do you feel that consumers have more or less choice today than perhaps they did in, in the past? Um, and from that perspective, I mean, that's a good or bad state of affairs. Um, and about prices, do you think that prices have stayed um, roughly the same over the years? Have they increased? Have they, have they, have they decreased? Um, and if you think they have increased, what do you think is leading to um, those higher prices? I've asked you a whole series of questions <laughs> here, but um, I have at it. Okay. <laughs> um, I'll try to hit them one by one. Um, I think the, the issue you bring up about um, consumers' busy lives and two-income households, I think a lot of that has led to consumer demand for um, convenience, for foods that are already prepared, kind of sort of ready-to-eat foods, or partially ready-to-eat that food consumers can take home, uh, heat up, and serve as quickly as possible. And we've seen uh, not only food companies, but also retailers um, offering more prepackaged foods, more ready-to-eat foods. That are that are already like you can already you can go there and get a chicken roasted chicken that's already ready to go, um, those those types of things. Um, they uh, on the issue of choice, uh, I think there is uh, more choice than we had, you know, um, decades ago. But part of that I think is probably the illusion of choice, in that one company is owning many different brands, and so consumers may be uh, thinking there's a difference between a couple of different. Uh, types of food, but it's it's all owned by the they all owned by the same company because they're just different brands owned by by one company. Um, and consumers, as I said earlier, want more information about their food. They don't necessarily have that type of information to make those sorts of sorts of uh, informed decisions or or just informed understanding of, of what's going on. And then on the uh, price issue, um, I, I think prices have gone up over over the past you know decades. Um, the the I think key issue though is how prices go up in relation to what the farmers the farmers get. So if the farmers are getting um, additional money, and then or, or uh, let me let me start again. If, if uh, supply goes down and prices go up, prices go up pretty quickly for consumers, and consumers have to pay that price. When um, supply increases, prices don't go down as quickly as they go up, and sometimes they stay elevated for a certain period of time. Now, there's a number of different, maybe a number of different reasons for that, but that's something that consumers are having to deal with and having to, um, to, to pay for. Um, when those prices go up quickly, they have to pay for that, and then it just often doesn't go down as, as rapidly. And that, of course, impacts low-income consumers uh, at a, to a greater degree because they spend more of their uh, disposable income on food. And we've talked about. I, I, I just need to. I just wanted to address Chris's statement that prices are going up. That's simply not borne out by the facts. When you look at USDA's data, the the proportion of family income that is spent on food in general and food at home has 
completely plummeted since uh, since the 1940s. I mean, even, you know, at the uh, turn of the century, we were paying 50 percent of uh, of our uh, income, family income on food. Now it's 5.5 percent. In the 1940s, it was about 19 percent. So I just wanted to uh, make a comment on that. Thank you. Okay. Well, now that's interesting. I mean, uh, if we're paying a smaller percentage of our income for food, does that mean that the amount of income that we have has increased in relation to um, the prices that are charged, or is it that prices have gone down? What, what's, what do you think the variables are? Well, I mean, when you look at that statistic, that's the real cost of food to people. Okay. So that's what it's saying. And the real cost, there's no question that it has gone down tremendously. And that's certainly raised quality of life in our country. You know, um, even today in other industrialized nations, such as uh, in France and Spain, they're paying about 15 percent of their family income on food. Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay. You look at Russia and China, it's about 30 percent. Indonesia, 50 percent. So you can see how that really raises quality of life in our nation, and it's um, it's uh, it's essential to consumers. It's really benefited. Hey, Eric, let, let, let's. I mean, I, I want to make sure there's clarity on this point. Uh, there's a dis there's a difference between what we spend for food at home and what we spend for food. Totally. Right. Because we obviously spend a lot of fun, uh, right. resources. Right. And now we're spending more at restaurants. Right. Too. So, so, but, so what is the percentage of what we spend on food in total? That has dropped. Um, in the 1940s, it was about 20 percent on food total. Uh, and now, today, it's around 9 percent. Yes, so it's, it's dropped yeah. uh, tremendously, too. But for food at home that you're purchasing at a supermarket, uh, that's dropped at about an even faster pace. Secretary, can I ask a question there? Is there a component of that that's due to price fluctuation? Because prices of some commodities have gone up, obviously, and right. consumers tend to cut back, I think, when prices go up. I can remember growing up when milk would get expensive and, you know, we'd be cutting back on milk for a while or cutting back on meat for a while when meat went up. And so there must be a mix in the basket that also, because it does seem to me that some prices have gone up and down over time at the retail level. Yeah, certainly prices fluctuate at the retail level. These <laughs> metrics are, you're looking at each year, you know, it's on an annual basis. But they're including the staples. You mm -hmm. know, consumers are still going to buy milk, they're going to buy meat, they're going to buy produce. I mean, we need this uh, to sustain ourselves. So they have fluctuated, but because the competition is so intense in our industry, and the margins are penny on the dollar, that the prices that consumers are paying, the true costs of food for them, have declined consistently over the past uh, many, many, many decades. But it's still, if I may, when prices do go up, they go up quicker than they come down. And that's, that's a burden on consumers, or can yeah, be a well burden that, on consumers. And that's also a phenomenon that's found in all industries, too, price asymmetry. Where, and that's because the decisions that you have to make to lower prices take a longer time than they do to raise prices, because you may have to get labor, you may have to expand production, expanding stores. Those are all, um, you're taking a bigger risk. That's the bottom line when you cut prices. And the Justice Department did a paper on this uh, recently, and they explained that phenomenon. I, I'm curious, the word relationship has been uh, used here uh, frequently uh, in the short time that we've, that we've been visiting here. Uh, t for the producers, I'm interested in, in, in your perception of that relationship, and for the, and for the folks who are, are, are representing packers of the retail side, are these relationships, uh, since they're such long term, is it more difficult then for someone who wants to develop a relationship to be able to do that? In other words, if you, are, uh, if you have a relationship, a packer to a retailer, how does another retailer engage in an opportunity uh, if, if the relationship is so strong and so long term. Ben, we'll just go right down the line. I did, like speaking comment. from my producer side, it takes years to build a relationship to, to become a, a vendor for Whole Foods or Safeway to, to get in, into that door. It takes several years and especially at producer at my side, it takes a long time to develop that relationship. But I, I, I tend to dis, disagree that the variety of food in the supermarket is 
more. I, I think it's even less. It's, been, it's just been repackaged. You know, it's just been different branded. And if you go to the supermarket now, you know you was buying a pound of, of uh, leaf lettuce. If you look at the bag, it said 12 ounces now, or eight ounces. But I think if we are to continue 10 years or 20 years down, we want more farm, more of that retail dollar have to be returned to farmers. I, I know a lot, uh, the gentleman stated that the Kroger supermarket buyers told me they operate an offer two pennies. I find that hard to believe. But if it's any way possible, if we're going to increase the number of farmers we have, or even hold on to the one we have, definitely the margin should be reflect return to the farmer. And, and, and that's the only way we're going to increase the number of farmers, or even maintain the one we have. Because what we are receiving as farmers is just too low to continue to operate. When we talk about relationships, I, I think they take lots of shapes and forms in the industry. But, but clearly, as you're trying to satisfy the need of a customer, you build up, a, there's this trust that's built up, and the, and, the, and the product development associated with it is built up. And it, it makes it very difficult for others to fit into that mix, especially between the packer and the retailer. But certainly the overriding factor is competition and, and ultimately price and the, and the desire to keep the, the prices as, as manageable as possible. On the other end of the equation, the relationship with the, with the producers uh, is, is somewhat different in the sense that producers, depending on the complexity of their product, if, I'll use an example. If, if you're producing a non hormone treated cattle for export to Europe, that's, that's a lifetime commitment to that animal. So you're looking at probably 20, 24 months of commitment on that animal before you can ever market it. Uh, it's very unlikely that producers will, will get into that marketplace unless they know they have a, a commitment to buy that product so it can be marketed in a marketplace that will capture full value and can be passed back. So those kind of relationships become fairly firm. Where they, where they really have to t target very specific attributes. In the case of, of lesser demand on the attributes, may, maybe it's something like a certain, an Angus program, something where there's a larger supply. The relationship doesn't have to be necessarily be as firm, but there still needs to be a relationship there that says, you're going to be able to supply this product, and if I supply this product, I'm going to, I'm going to get a premium for it, uh, knowing that at the, ultimately, at the ultimate consumer, there's going to be a premium paid for it. So there's an opportunity to pass that, those, uh, those funds back through, and everybody that added some of the value can capture some of that value in the process. So I think the relationship is critical. Uh, it's, certainly, there are opportunities, uh, given the, 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 the cow herd size right now, especially uh, the demand for livestock certainly is, uh, much exceeds the, uh, the supply side. Most of our Packer members are, are not killing anywhere near full capacity. So there's certainly demand there. We know our export markets are, are, have excess demand. So, so certainly the demand's there. So uh, if, if a producer has a product that fits the needs of the, of the ultimate consumer and there's a Packer that's servicing that consumer, uh, they're all welcome and, and invited to come in and be a part of the marketplace because their demand is certainly exceeding the, uh, the supply of in these unique programs. Eric. Well, it's all about meeting consumer demands, and our retailers work with suppliers both large and small. We're interested in any product that consumers want. And with the smaller guys, many of our retailers will work with them to help uh, innovate products that are going to meet consumer demands. We have a lot of resources that can help suppliers in terms of consumer behavior. So we work closely with them, and even on, um, on safety standards, We'll help smaller, uh, some of our members work with the smaller producers uh, and suppliers to help them meet the um, rigorous safety standards that we have to ensure that all the foods we're selling is sa uh, are safe. So um, we, uh, yeah, there's lots of opportunities. If I understood your question correctly, you, you kind of related to uh, how does the retailer uh, get in with, with the wholesaler as the, the opportunities once he's got his own uh, list of clients. The only connection I would have with that is through Angus Association and Certified Angus Beef. 
And under certified Angus beef, we, we welcome new retailers all the time. They have to meet certain specifications and jump through hoops. And then we monitor them after they come on and make sure that they are selling our product and advertising it correctly in that. And we have no problem. I mean, there's usually quite a waiting list for people to get on as far as that. But we work with them and make changes where possible in that. But as a producer, there are producers out there. There's neighbors and friends that have marketed their cattle through various programs like All Natural and shooting for a certain end product. And they've been careful with the shots and this and that, documenting all that and that. But most of them only do it for a year or two, and then they switch, try to go somewhere else, because the premiums are not there is the main reason. I guess they start out with great hopes and that, and then they find the extra cost of the workload and that way. It doesn't work that way, and you usually see them switch. In order to join those verified programs and that, a lot of them end up having to feed them through custom lots and sign contracts. Some of those are open-ended contracts, unpriced, and that price will be on the base price the day that cattle are harvested, and that base price is usually on a diminishing scale. It's usually going down. I myself have fed cattle three consecutive years where some of those cattle went through a branded program with the Red Angus Association, and some of those cattle that went along of the same type and the same genetic makeup were of a different breed, and they went through the cash price for that day. And the cash price or the base price difference between the ones that went through there was anywhere from $1 to $2.75 lower. So as a producer, they usually get discouraged because there is no firm price at the end of the rainbow for us. I think your question was on relationships. And the, you know, I think, you know, the one thing we do bring as a supplier, like for us as a co-op, is we have our farmers have a relationship with the retailer or the food service distributor, so that's something we bring. But, you know, with that said, I think it's, I think Ben mentioned it, I think it would be very difficult, it's very difficult to see a buyer, mainly because they're buried. You know, they've been consolidated, too. They used to buy, there used to be ten buyers, now there's one buying ten categories. So they're very busy, and that's the relationship, one of the things they value. If you can take care of supply chain and quality, keep all those things in line, that's what they value in a relationship, and that's how you keep getting business year to year. Now, with that said, you still have to be competitive. Both of our major food service suppliers put us out to bid this year, and about half our retailers did. And we lost, we just lost business we've had for years to a Chinese importer at a limited assortment chain. So you still have to be competitive. But I think those things you add, the things that they value in the relationship are important, or I know they are, and that we've got to keep earning it every day. That particular relationship is sort of outside of where we are on consumers, but I will say that there is a small but growing segment of consumers that are trying to establish their own relationships with farmers and with folks that provide food through farmers markets and CSAs and those types of things that are kind of going directly to the source and getting their food that way. Eric, the issue of margins is often a topic of discussion that whether it comes from the producer level or the retailer level. Some have said that a retailer or a packer profit margin is very thin. Now, without getting any kind of proprietary information, generally speaking, what are the margins that a retailer contends with, or what does it take to generate a profit? I mean, what are the fixed or variable costs that retailers operate under, and do retailers then pass those costs on down the marketing chain? I'm happy to address that, Mr. Attorney General. Profit margins in our industry are very thin. We are talking about a penny on the dollar. And I think there's a misconception, too, that meat is a profit center in the stores. I know before I joined the industry, I thought that it was, just assumed it. But it's not the case. Actually, meat's frequently a loss leader. And the margins on meat are considerably lower than the margin on the average product in the store. 
Now, like other, co other products, competition is really fierce on meat. And I know there have been discussions about the farm to retail uh, spread determined by ERS and how the long term sh tread shows that spread uh, widening. But I think it's far too simplistic to just look at the spread between the farm price and the retail price and assume that the retailer is making a lot of profit on meat. This is simply not borne out by the facts. Uh, and in fact, ERS has cautioned about using the data in that way. And they've stated that the retail value figure that they've calculated <coughs> overstates retail values and isn't really a good measure of what consumers are paying at the store. One of the reasons is that because is that it is not volume weighted. When you lower prices, it generates demand. And a huge proportion of the, the meats uh, products that we're selling are on sale or uh, on special. And there's also an assumption in the ERS data that supermarkets sell beef in a wholesale carcass from the day they purchased it from the farmer, which we know that's not true because weeks elapse from the time the animal is processed to the day the meat hits the shelf. The, the costs we face, of course, are transportation, warehousing, labor, refrigeration, taxes, rent, regulatory costs, uh, over, other overhead costs, and those aren't reflected in the spreads to, uh, data. And these costs are, are high and they're growing. Um, and it's also important to consider that we can't really pass those costs on uh, downstream. It's very difficult because of the intense competition on price. So um, it's also important to contemplate that supermarkets are just one of the outlets for meat, too. Restaurants and exports have become more important. So USDA has, in fact, stated that the wholesale to retail price spreads probably have less of an effect on livestock prices than they did in the past. But if meat's a, a loss leader, um, where then do you look for profits? I mean, where do profits come from if, if, if meat is, as you say, sometimes a loss leader or the margins there are, are as small as they are? Yeah, I, profits are slightly higher on packaged goods. Okay. Um, and, and they're a little bit higher on produce, too. So the, those, are, those are some of the areas where the... Um, where the profit margins are a little bit better. But they're all really, really narrow. Mm -hmm. How about dairy, Eric? Um, I, I don't have the dairy data in front of me, but I, um, I can go through my file and get that. Okay. Sure, go ahead. Uh, in, uh, to con con uh, add to your what you just said there about uh, the costs are not passed down, uh, you, you're stuck with them. And I'll agree yeah, your margins actually, aren't, aren't very... Uh, big and, and that, but uh, indirectly, all costs when the consumer quits buying come back down to the producer. They, they come back down to, to the wholesaler, and the wholesaler has one of two things. He can either drop his price to you or he can cut product, production. Well, he's got fixed costs that he has to meet and, and production lines that he has to keep busy. So usually the, the alternative, and I would say nearly 100 percent of the time, is to, is to lower his procurement cost to us. So. Indirectly, all costs do come back to the producer. You know, we've also talked, in addition to relationship, uh, the word transparency and communication, uh, those two words have been used. And I'm, I'm interested in the, all of the panelists commenting on this. Given what you know about the marketing chain, and given what you know about your piece of it, whatever it might be, or whatever your organization, uh, what piece your organization might be involved in, do you believe there is adequate transparency uh, and communication in the chain today? If you do, fine. If you don't, what changes would you suggest we consider? Let me start, Chris, if I can start with you. Sure. Um, I would just point again to the, the uh, information needs of consumers and how those are not always met. Um, a, an example of that is country of origin labeling, which is something that was fought for for a long time. Basic information about where uh, commodity products come from. And um, that was fought by the industry. They didn't want to provide consumers with that information. And we do now have that information. It's not on all products. It's only on um, commodity products. So it's not on packaged goods. It's not on uh, dairy, for example, and some other, other areas. But, but that's, an, that's an area, again, where consumers could have more information, could be better informed when they're in the marketplace. Yeah, I would, I would say you're, you're right, Chris. I didn't even think at the very end of the transparency. But the, uh, 
There is transparency in terms of what our, uh, our customers ask us, the retailers and food service, about. They want to know where our products are grown. You know, we need that for recall as well. But they are interested in who's growing it, where it's grown. We have farm visits every year. And then um, the inf on the information side, they need transparency to know where their products are at all time, all the way to uh, distribution and, and pickup. So what, what about pricing? Is there adequate transparency in terms of pricing? Um, you mean, do I tell them our cost? No. Well, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, is, is, there, is there adequate information for a producer to know that they're getting a fair price? Oh, for our producers, um, it's pretty simple because we're all, um, uh, they have commercial price um, negotiations. So all of our products are represented by uh, associations like the California Tomato Growers Association or the Peach Association. So there is a, a mechanism to uh, pool all that and then um, find a commercial price. So I think that that transparency works well because there is an ebb and flow. If, the, if our producers aren't getting the price they need, we see supply go down or, or push back. And then as a co-op, we don't negotiate, but our target internally is to meet commercial price. Or we probably wouldn't have a co-op if we didn't do that either. So. Uh, as far as transparency of uh, the label of, of bringing stuff, uh, there's producers out there are willing, and, and many of them are working with that now today to identify their product and, and uh, pass along that information on to the wholesalers. Whether it gets on to the uh, retailer and the, and the customer, that's a that's a big if. I, I suspect a lot of that gets lost along the way. I've got neighbors that have documented, you know, that when the calves are born and, and where they and the location and all that and the treatments they've had. And uh, you never see that when you go to the retail counter. Uh, it may help them sell that product to the retailer, but I don't know if the consumer is getting that. As far as transparency of price uh, at the production level to the wholesaler, there there is no transparency. Uh, we're at the mercy of whatever they want to give us out there. Uh, it's 66 percent of, of the markets are now are, are through contracts, and many of them are open end or alternative marketing marketing agreements, and uh, those those really are working against us because they're captive supply that they they got a group of cattle under that contract that can come they know they're coming on such and such a day if they get enough of those cattle in there they don't even put bids on any of the uh, of the uh, bid cattle like through the auction markets and that they'll tell their buyers not to even bid on cattle they've gotten enough for a week or two or if they've got a fluctuation of of uh, import product coming in or something like that that works against us too for as captive supply and they may even use use that uh, non-bidding process to, and they own a lot of cattle themselves, 10% of the cattle that, that go through our, our packer owned cattle. They, they can bring them in and, and uh, not have any bids for, say, a week or two. And that forces all the cattle that are on feed to, to wait longer on feed, which increases the amount of product out there and, and helps to cheapen our price, too. So basically, there's, there's no transparency, hasn't been any transparency. Uh, the best reference to this is the fact that uh, the, on the, in the farm to retail spread, we've lost 20% of our uh, retail value in, since not, between 1970 and 2002. And if you check that out, uh, the wholesale end has picked up 20%. There's, there's no question that prices are more transparent for consumers at the uh, retail level. I, um, I just got a smartphone not that long ago, and it actually has a barcode application in it and I can scan the products on the store and get a price uh, online for them and see what other uh, retailers are charging so uh, that's quite remarkable and it's it's driving competition it's making the consumer uh, even more aware of the prices so I think the trend is with, with increased technology and more of these apps um, we're going to be seeing even more competition and more transparency and Eric will share the name of that app at the conclusion of the, uh, <laughs> of the panel. Uh, transparency in the marketplace is, is very effective in the livestock industry. Uh, that's, that's very well driven by USDA's mandatory price reporting. The packers report all of their transactions on their procurement of livestock as well as their sale of, of products. Uh, so that information on the value of the product is, is very available. It's, it's, it's online. It's, it's, a, it's a very timely information multiple times a day. So I think, I think when you think about pricing in the livestock area, it's all out there for the industry to look at. Uh, when you start talking about things like 
uh, price spread from farm gate to retail, uh, all of a sudden you lo start losing sight of, of what you're trying to be transparent on. Uh, this, when you start, when you look at, when you look at price spreads and you try to compare it year to year, you're really apples and oranges at best. Uh, just looking at the median, there's just a few key things I would mention uh, that have changed the, the spread from farm gate to, to retail or to food service. When you start thinking about regulatory changes, food safety changes, food safety alone, in the last 10 years, the, the number of additional interventions that have been included in the packing industry, the, the cost of, of the regulatory impact of that, the cost of recalls, the, the cost of, of testing, the, the additional costs that have been, been incurred by the industry uh, just to get product through the process totally differ from the where they were 20 years ago. And, and, and as you start looking at really key things, product changes, all of you can remember when you went into a retail market and the traditional trim on a, on a strip loin was a half inch of fat uh, up to an inch of fat. That's not there anymore. That product has changed. Uh, the, the further processing that product has changed. So it's really erroneous to start looking at a, a spread and comparing it year to year. Yes, it's, it's interesting information to see that, that spread, but to try to tie that to a lack of transparency or a lack of information, I think is, is really misguided. <clears throat> From a producer standpoint, I don't see any transparency. Uh, from the time a, a farmer plant a seed or birth an animal, you're looking at a long-term commitment there. Uh, in the case of dairy farming, these cows have to be milked every day. Well, you have a sale for the milk or not, well, you get $1,600 or $21 per hundred weight. You still have to milk the cow. In the case of watermelon that I grow, uh, I plant a watermelon seed in 90 days, it's ready to be harvested. I have a perishable product. And I think buyers can use that against us as farmers because they know what we're growing only have a life to it, shelf life to it. We have to move the product. Uh, so we need that support of a safety net from USDA, from justice, and, and from the industry that we are assured of a fair, equitable marketplace so that we can survive. Now, the transparency, I personally don't believe it's there in that sense from a producer side. Okay. Yeah, just maybe as a, a last question, as a follow-up to what Ben was saying. I mean, it's obvious, I think, that producers need packers, um, just as packers need retailers and other marketing outlets. And everybody here works in agriculture in one form or another. What I'd like to do is kind of, as, as a wrap-up, make you all kings of this industry. Um, you've got absolute power. Um, what do you think we need to do to ensure that all segments are profitable, and that we have fairness in the market. So what would you do, total power, um, to ensure profitability and fairness? I don't know. Ben, we'll start with you. You're, you're the king. If I were the king, I would do away with all those major cooperations. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that would take care of it. I, guess, right? <laughs> uh, I While I'm king, I'm going to take a little different approach. I, 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 think, I think, obviously, food is, is essential, and, it, and the more cost-effective that process can be, the better. So I think that the more we can strengthen the communications and relationship between the producers of livestock to the ultimate consumer, the more efficiencies you're going to build in the system, the, more, the better quality and the better you're going to satisfy those needs. Now, with all that said, everybody in the sector has to be in, in a profitable situation or it doesn't exist. Uh, packers clearly are a pass-through. There are certain costs that are incurred that have to, be, have to be dealt with. But I think in order for the whole industry to survive, you have to look at ways to maximize the, into the, the total marketplace. And that's looking at things like exports. If I was king for a day, we would be, uh, we'd do away with all these uh, market access issues we have with our trading partners. But they certainly limit our ability to capture the full value of livestock. I mean, there, there, there's so many things that we need to really focus on in the marketplace to take out, take out 
restrictions to take out some of the burden that's in there to make it more streamlined and more efficient uh, for everybody in that whole marketing chain to be successful. Well, America, King, King Eric. <laughs> thank you. America is blessed with the best food and agricultural system in the world. We enjoy the safest, the freshest, best quality, and most affordable food on the planet. And everyone up here plays a role uh, in that system. Advancements in agriculture and vigorous competition among retailers have expanded access to quality and nutritious foods for the American people. And both DOJ and USDA deserve a tremendous amount of credit for, for that miracle, which is our food system. Without question, this has improved quality of, quality of life. Um, and this abundance is really essential to the American way of life. Competition is why our food system is so phenomenal. Um, our retail profit margins are razor thin, and consumers have been enjoy are enjoying a better shopping experience than ever before. And our recent survey shows that shopper satisfaction continues to rise. Nine out of ten people would recommend their uh, primary store to, to a friend. So Justice Warren famously said that the purpose of the antitrust laws is to protect competition, not competitors. Competition is more intense than it has ever been in the grocery industry, and consumers are benefiting greatly from this. So this competition must be maintained. Okay, Vaughn, profitability and fairness. Well, I'll agree with a lot that's been said is about uh, communications. We have to keep communications in this industry, and uh, it, we do enjoy the, the best uh, and safest food in, in the world right at this present time. But producers out there, a lot of them are a very patriotic bunch. Uh, most of them have come many generations from countries where there was oppression, and uh, they, they realize what they have in this country. And most of them want to continue to see that this is a great country. And there's great concern out there about the amount of, of food that's not coming from our country anymore and that some of our better food that is, is being ground and, and added to that product to make it better. But there's still a safety factor in there. So, so I would say that a lot of, lot of producers are, are concerned about that. Uh, as far as uh, competition, uh, we the best thing that, that we, as the producers could use out there is, is uh, a lot of people, and I've heard it here since I got here, are uh, talking we don't need more government telling us what to do, you know, and all that. But we've, we've had the Packers and Stockyards Act since 1921, and it's done nothing to us. And uh, so we're going to have to have some sort of rules if producers are going to remain in this, in this uh, game. Otherwise, we're going to see producers in Mexico, South America, uh, Canada, um, Argentina, other places. You won't, you won't know of an American... Uh, producer pretty soon probably unless it's a giant firm that's uh, maybe running tens of thousand cattle out there and has a contract with the packer. The family element is, is, is in real danger as far as, as uh, production agriculture is concerned. So I, I guess the, the best thing, we need to do something now, we need to do it quick, and the best way to enforce these rules has finally been proposed in the last year and it's these gypsum rules. And I, I guess I would like to see these GIPSA rules enforced. I, there's things that may have to be addressed in them in the final rule and changed to, to make them more workable and, and everything on that. But these rules are, are designed to prevent the past injustices from happening. And part of these rules also say that if, if those injustices continue, they will give me or any other producer out there the same of, uh, option to go into court just like any other American or any other American industry or entity. So we need, we need the gypsum rules, and we need them immediately. I guess I'll second that because the, uh, no one will applaud for me. The, um, <laughs> um, you know, I do believe our system is ultimately effective in terms of competition, primarily because it starts with the consumer. That's why retailers have such slim margins, because the consumer will go next door if they don't get it. And that goes all the way down to us. And unfortunately, the last person to get pushed is the producer. There's no doubt about that. Um, but I do think our system works well. Um, I think the one thing I'd ask if, if I were king is, uh, for a day at least, the, uh, we're asked to do a lot of things, um, uh, especially in California with environmental air. Uh, we're, we have 4,000 Teamster jobs, so we provide good working wages. Um, we do a lot of things. Uh, that I think are important um, and I think are ultimately are good for our country. Um, but it's very difficult when I have to compete against an import where none of those things are required except for price. Um, and somehow that value 
uh, that, that has to be, is implied when you farm in America. I don't know where that comes from, but somewhere it has to be rec recognized. So. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm a consumer advocate, so I have a long list of things that I would change <laughs> if I was a king for a day. Um, but just for uh, to hit on a couple um, for the purposes of this discussion, one would be um, information, as I've said before. Um, that's important for consumers to be able to have enough information to make decisions and, um, and when they're in the marketplace. Um, access, uh, I would improve access to uh, health and food, period, but specifically healthy, nutritious food that's that's affordable, um, particularly for low-income consumers. And then, um, because I do most of my work on food safety, I do have to address the safest food supply in the world comment. Um, it's, not <laughs> it's not as good as it needs to be and can be, um, and we have 5,000 people that get sick every year from, or excuse me, die every year from foodborne illness, and that's something that we certainly need to, uh, that I would improve if I was king for a day. Well, thank you uh, all very much. Uh, we're going to uh, going to give the Attorney General an uh, uh, opportunity to, to close, but before I do, I want to thank the panelists for a very informative and uh, interesting conversation uh, and one that uh, points out the complexity of these issues that we're dealing with and the, and the, and the difficulty in, in determining at what point you get the proper balance between competition, efficiency, uh, low prices for consumers, but uh, uh, reasonable profits for producers. It's, it is a delicate balance. There's no question about that. Uh, we are going to, uh, after the Attorney General's uh, comments, we're going to break uh, for a few minutes, uh, and then the second panel will be focused on margins in the dairy industry. Uh, Mark uh, Toby, who is a special counsel for agriculture and state relations antitrust division of the Department of Justice, will moderate uh, that panel discussion. Then that will be followed by public testimony, an opportunity for people to uh, uh, put their comments into the public record that's being as assembled from these meetings. Uh, there will be a break for lunch, and then uh, we'll have a third panel uh, focused on issues in food retailing, going into uh, more of the issues that we've talked about briefly here in, in greater depth. Uh, again, um, uh, Sheriff Posen, who is the Chief of Staff of the Antitrust Division, will be uh, moderating that conversation. That will be followed by uh, a break, and then the uh, final panel, um, which will be in margins in the livestock and poultry industry. Uh, James McDonald, who is uh, from USDA, uh, ERS, will be moderating that conversation. We'll have, again, additional opportunities for public testimony if we haven't concluded uh, all of the remarks earlier. Uh, and then we will, uh, we will close, uh, uh, hopefully, sometime around 5, uh, 530 uh, this afternoon. So, uh, again, I want to thank everyone. I want to thank the Attorney General. Uh, you know, he made a pledge to, to be fully participating in these uh, hearings, uh, uh, and I appreciate the fact he's traveled and, and that Christine Varney has traveled all over the country uh, to listen to the, um, to the words and testimonies and stories of folks who are farming the land and, and who are uh, responsible for this food supply that we take sometimes for granted, um, a food supply that is abundant, uh, a food supply that does provide us greater flexibility uh, with our paychecks than most folks around the world have, um, and a food supply that comes from, uh, from folks who, uh, who really do believe in the basic fundamentals uh, of this country uh, and just simply want a fair shake uh, in return. So, Mr. Attorney General, the floor is yours. Well, this, I think, as all the other uh, panels that I participated in, um, the sessions that we've had has been one for me that's been extremely enlightening. Uh, I think we're talking about, you know, a segment, uh, a sector of our economy that's really more than that. It has defined, I think, what this country has been um, over the years, who we are as a people, who we are as a nation. And I think it's an important thing for us to focus on because I think it will define who we will become uh, in the 21st century and even, even, even beyond. Our concern at the Justice Department as well as at agriculture um, is to ensure that we have fairness uh, in this important part of our economy, um, that it is as profitable as it possibly can be, and that we uh, put as much transparency into the system as we, as we possibly can so that ultimately uh, all components, all parts of this sector um, do well and that the American people ultimately are the beneficiaries of, of our action. Uh, we are 
under Christine Varney's leadership, um, bound and determined to stay, um, you know, tied with our partners in agriculture in ensuring those three things, as I said, um, fairness, profitability, and, and, and transparency. I think there's a partnership that has been established between uh, justice and between and, and agriculture that um, did not exist before and frankly should have existed uh, before. Uh, our pledge in the Obama administration is to stay involved, uh, to continue to listen. Uh, we have thoughts, we have ideas, but we know that we don't have all of all of the answers. And that is, I think, one of the real values in um, in these these workshops that we that we have had. Um, we will use the information that we glean from uh, these workshops, and then from the thousands of comments, as I said, that we have received as we are developing enforcement policies, enforcement practices. Um, so that we do all that we can to ensure uh, the continued viability of this very, very important part of our economy. So it's been a real pleasure for me to be on this panel with, uh, with all of you and a real pleasure to uh, have this new relationship uh, with my colleague at the Department of Agriculture. Very good. We'll uh, reconvene at, uh, at 10.30. Okay. Health next? We can do this on Catherine's. We'll just keep it to health.